Hello again, my name is Brooke and I'm a geologist. This week we're going to be looking at pictures of a rock that one of our viewers has sent in and we're going to try and figure out what it is they found. I'm particularly excited about this rock because it means I get to talk about the area that I grew up in and one of my favourite fossils, crinoids. You've probably noticed as well that today I'm not in the archive or outside like I was in the last video. I'm actually in the XRD lab which is where I do a lot of our, my research. It's where our lab manager, Kat, works her magic on our samples and we get to find out what minerals are actually inside them. This week's rock was sent in by nine-year-old Nathan and his mum, Mav. They were collecting fossils over at Robin Hood's Bay and found something quite interesting. So let's take a look at it and see what they've got. Mav and Nathan found this rock in Boggle Hall. Boggle Hall's located in Robin Hood's Bay, and that's up on the North Yorkshire coast near a place called Whitby. You might not have heard of it before, but the North Yorkshire coast is actually world famous for its Jurassic rocks and the beautiful fossils that they contain. The most famous fossils are the ammonites and the marine reptiles, but there's a whole host of marine organisms that are preserved in these rocks that don't get as much attention. And that's exactly what Mav and Nathan have found in this nice little specimen that they've collected. Before we can talk about the fossils, we need to understand the sediments that contain them, as those sediments actually recorded information about the environment that the creature lived, died, and then was preserved in. The most obvious grains in the rock are the fossils themselves, but we'll talk about those in a bit. As we discussed in my other video, this rock's made out of grains, so it's granular. Some of those grains are too fine for us to see, and they're probably made of silica clays and carbonates. We can refer to these as mud, which is just a generic term for grains that are too small to see. When you look at the photo, you might see that there are sparkly little grains in there, and that's what makes up most of the sediment. Those are bits of quartz sand. The quartz sand ranges in size from about half a millimetre down to stuff we can barely see, and that stuff we can barely see gets referred to as silt. So because we've got a lot of sand, a bit of clay and a bit of silt, we can now name this rock as a silty sandstone. And because it's got fossils in it, we can call it fossiliferous. So the full name is a fossiliferous silty sandstone. So now let's look at the fossils. If you look in the centre of this picture, you can see a nice pattern in the rock. And that's the imprint left by the shell of a bivalve. Bivalves are things like mussels, clams, scallops and oysters all of which are a type of mollusk, like snails. This one looks like a type of ancient scallop called clamis, which is a pretty common fossil that you find all over Western Europe in late Triassic and early Jurassic rocks. The fact it's so common and widespread is really useful because it means that whenever we find rocks with clamis in, we know that we're going to be within this window between the late Triassic and early Jurassic. And when you've got four and a half billion years worth of Earth history, being able to narrow it down to just a few million years by looking at a shell is pretty nifty. Once you get your eye in, you'll see that the shell is broken, there's only one part of it there. And you'll also notice that there are these white jagged streaks, and there are other bits of shell that have also been broken up. The fact that they're all broken up tells us something about the environment. The energy level here must have been pretty high because it's kind of hard to smash these shells. The organisms make them so that they're hard. The most common way in nature that shells get smashed up is either by predators or by the waves. Just think about walking along on a beach and seeing all of those smashed up shells on the tide line. Most of that damage was done by them being smashed off each other and off the sand, but just by the power of the waves. Okay, let's look at the crinoid now. These are one of my favorite ever fossils. They're so weird probably never heard of them. They're still alive in the modern day, but they mostly live in the deep oceans, apart from a few swimming ones that live around coral reefs. They look like flowers and are sometimes called sea lilies, but they're actually related to starfish and sea urchins. Mind blown. Imagine a starfish, turn it upside down and attach it to the seabed by a long stalk, and that's what a crinoid looks like. They're the kind of things you'd half expect to see in the Moss Eisley Cantina. Although they're rare today, in Earth's distant past, these things were really, really common. They would form meadows, because, you know, they look like flowers, that covered huge areas of the seabed. So what parts of the crinoids have Mav and Nathan actually found in this little rock? 
what we've got here are the most commonly found parts of the crinoids, and that's the long stalks that attach them to the seabed, which we call a columnal. The columnals made of lots of little segments that we call ossicles. Some crinoids have round ossicles, some crinoids have pentagonal ossicles, but the one we've got here have these nice little star-shaped ossicles. They look really cute. I've got some examples here of early Jurassic crinoids from Yorkshire, so let's have a quick look at them under the microscope to see what they look like close up. You can clearly see here the star-shaped ossicles. They've been really nicely preserved in a mineral called calcite, and calcite is actually what crinoids made their bodies out of. Those ridges and grooves around the outside allowed the ossicles to link together. This meant that the crinoid stalk could be flexible, but also really strong and secure. Here's an example of a mostly complete crinoid, so you can see what the head end looked like. You can see that they've got many branching arms, which they would use to grasp food out of the water, and then they would feed that to a mouth that was in the middle of that body section there. Incidentally, the crinoid's anus also protruded from the top of its head next to its mouth in a long tube, which we call the anal tube. So just be thankful that you don't have an anal tube next to your mouth. In these dorset examples, the calcite that the creature was originally made of has been replaced by pyrite. Just before we move on, we'll have a quick look at the crinoids under the petrographic microscope. As I rotate the stage, you can see that each bit of crinoid blinks on and off in one go. And that's because each section of crinoid is actually made of one single crystal. And that's a trait that's unique to crinoids and starfish and sea urchins and all of the other creatures that are related to them known as echinoderms. Those black bits everywhere are pyrite. It's metallic so light can't shine through it no matter how thin you get it. Here's a close-up of those ridges we saw earlier and you can actually see how nicely they interlock but there's still a bit of room, a bit of space between them so that each of the plates could move in relation to each other and the crinoid could then til tilt itself in relation to the currents so it was best placed to catch food out of the water. Back to Nathan and Mav's sample, we can see we've got these strange crinoid ossicle shaped holes and that's where the calcite was dissolved away over the millions of years after the ossicle was buried in the sediment. We might be sad that the fossil's gone, but the imprint it left behind is still really cool. So based on these photos, I would probably identify these crinoids as something like pentacrinites or isocrinites. I'm not a crinoid expert, but those are the two most common that you find in early Jurassic rocks in North Yorkshire. We've got a few mystery bits and pieces in this rock that I can't quite work out. Like these dark bits, this could be organic matter and pyrite that's within the sediment, or it could be bits of plant material washed off the nearby landmass. It's difficult to say just from the photo. We can also see there's a lot of squiggles and wiggles within the sediment around the fossils, and there's going to be two different sources for this mostly. Some of it is going to be caused by the waves chopping about on the seafloor, moving the shells around and moving the sediment about, and we call these sedimentary structures. Some of those wiggles and squiggles actually look like little tubes, and that's exactly what they are. While the crinoids and bivalves were sat on the seabed, underneath them the mud was full of all kinds of worms and other critters that were wriggling around, leaving behind trace fossils, which are fossils of animal behaviour, not of the actual bodies of the animals themselves. And they're still just as cool, because they're like little moments of time, captured forever. If you ever go to Boggle Hall or the North Yorkshire coast yourself, you've now got a good idea of the kinds of things to look out for. So there we go, we got all of that information just from looking at some photos of that one little rock. Hope you've enjoyed today's episode and a big thank you to Nathan and Mav for taking photos of that rock and then sending it in to me. So what did you think about today's rock? What do you think about crinoids and clams? Leave a comment below and let me know. Or maybe find me on the social and tag me in pictures of your favourite rocks and we can talk about them. As ever, I would really super appreciate it if you give this video a like, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, hit the little notification bell, and then you can find me on the social media as well if you want to talk about rocks. So until next time, thanks a lot for tuning in, take care and see you later.